So we're still in Matthew chapter 16. We're looking at verses 20 to 28. And if you remember, the passage before, we had Jesus asking the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus was very excited about this. He explained how Peter had had this revelation given to him by God. And then Jesus calls Peter a rock and explains and promises that he's going to build his church and that Peter is going to be part of the foundation of that church. And we explained how Jesus is the capstone, the cornerstone, in other words, the very first stone laid down. And then we saw how in Ephesians 4, you've got the apostles and prophets as a foundation. So we know that Peter and the other apostles ended up being a foundation on which other stuff is then built. And what, what Peter bound and loosed in heaven would be bound and loose on earth. And we saw how that has application to us today, that we have a role in binding and loosing. In other words, telling people the gospel so that they can come into the kingdom and telling people the gospel so that they know if they are coming into the kingdom or not, and they know that if they're not repenting, then they cannot come into the kingdom. So we looked at that, and that brings us to verse 20, where we start today. Matthew 16, verse 20. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me for you are not set in your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let's pray. Jesus, we pray that you would be glorified now as we look at your word. I pray that you would change our hearts as we look at your word, that we wouldn't be a hindrance to you and your ministry. I pray, Lord God, that you would stop all the works of Satan this morning, trying to stop the truth changing our lives. Pray that you would renew our minds today pray that you would help us to gird up our loins, to be ready for action, to respond to your word today, to leave this room different people to how we came in. Lord, I pray that you would give me strength to deliver this message. My back is hurting so much right now. And I pray, Father, that you would give me healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now, the, the last century, in this country at least, and all over the Western world, has been obsessed with self-esteem. We've continually tried to boost our self-esteem, convinced that if we only boost our self-esteem, we'd be better people. At the same time, interestingly, the last century has been the bloodiest century in the history of the world. What does that tell you about boosting your self-esteem? Some people think self-esteem improves performance, but John MacArthur points out that they did a test with six different nations and they got math students to do a test. 
And at the end of the test, they asked them, are you good at maths? And the American students, they all wrote, oh, I'm very good at maths, or something like that. And uh, they did worst out of all the six nations in the maths. Now, Koreans, uh, I assume it was South Koreans, they, they wrote that they weren't very good at maths, and yet they got the highest scores out of everyone. And John MacArthur makes the point that boosting your self-esteem does not necessarily make you perform better. And looking at the world over the last hundred years, we can see that boosting your self-esteem definitely doesn't stop violence. At the same time, we've got shopping centers that are filled with adverts that are continually telling you, you need to buy this, you'll be a better person with this, you'll have a good-looking woman if you wear this. All these adverts telling us all these things that we need, telling us that we need to treat ourselves and do what's best for ourselves and live as comfortably as possible. Internet connections are getting faster. Renting movies online has become easier. And buying and downloading MP3s is easier than it's ever been before. And the comfort of our lives has increased with microwaves and even faster microwaves and all kinds of things that make your life more comfortable. Yet at the same time, we're seeing an increase in sin. We're seeing an increase in killings, especially youth killings, happening not just in London, but all over the UK. An unprecedented amount of young people are getting murdered at the same time that society is saying, take care of yourself, live a comfortable life. So we're seeing that self-esteem don't seem to be the answer and living a comfortable life doesn't seem to be the answer. Now this might all seem depressing. I agree. I think the self-esteem message is depressing. I think the take care of yourself, live the best life you can now message is very depressing. But today's Bible text is refreshing. We're not going to look at what Freud said. We're not going to look at what Maslow said or what Rogers said. Today we're going to see what did Jesus say. We're going to look at the things of God and not the things of man. And we're going to see that what Jesus preaches is not self-esteem, but is self-denial. Let's go through it phrase by phrase. Verse 20. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, notice he didn't say to his disciples, tell people that I'm not the Christ. And Christ means Messiah. Yeah, he didn't say, tell them that I'm not the Messiah. Instead, he's saying, don't tell anyone that I'm the Messiah, that I'm the Christ. So it wasn't that Jesus wanted people to not know that he was the Messiah. He did want them to know, but he wanted them to know in the right way what the Messiah was and not in the wrong way. Let me give you an example of the wrong way. The wrong way would be if the disciples just went around and told everyone, Jesus is the Messiah, and loads of people had nationalistic feelings. Loads of Jews would have been like, yes, the Messiah's here, let's go kill all the Romans, the Messiah's going to wipe them out, and we're okay because we're Jews. Jesus didn't want them thinking that. That would have been the wrong idea. He didn't want them having unrepentant messianic expectations. Well, they had them. In other words, they were expecting the Messiah to come and freedom from the Romans, but they weren't ready to repent of their sin. They weren't ready to turn from their sins and to plead mercy from the Messiah. So for this reason, Jesus didn't want his disciples just go around and say, oh, the Messiah's here. That would be the wrong way because then you'd have loads of people trying to follow him, trying to get rid of the Romans and missing the whole point that they need to repent to enter the kingdom. So instead, Jesus wants it to happen the right way. And the right way was through him performing miracles, which pointed to the fact that he was a Messiah, in preaching the kingdom and repentance and asking, who do you say I am? as we saw he did to the disciples. So all these miracles he did and the preaching he did, all was supposed to elicit a response from people about who Jesus was. It was all supposed to make people think, who is this Jesus bloke? And that's why in the Gospel of Matthew, you see this emphasis on how do people respond to who Jesus is. And at the same time, God 
giving people revelation like he did for Peter and saying, you are the Christ. So we can draw from this that Jesus wants people to know him in the proper way and he wants people to follow him the proper way. Now this is really important because many people don't. Did anyone see 60 Minutes in the last week? 60 Minutes in America. They had a famous preacher who was claiming that it's not his job, and I'm really paraphrasing what he said. Basically he was saying it's not his job to tell people that they're bad or tell them about their sin, but it was his job to every Sunday make them feel really good about themselves. Now, he's not letting people know Jesus the proper way. There's no point making someone feel good about themselves if they're in a wrong relationship with God and if they need to repent. Jesus wants people to know him the proper way. He doesn't want to just have people run around saying this is the Messiah and even though people don't understand what the Messiah is, they say, yeah, we follow the Messiah. So today, what we're going to do is get to know Jesus the proper way and see how to follow him the proper way. Verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Notice it says, from that time, Jesus began. So we've got a turning point now. Jesus has been revealed who he is. And now Jesus starts explaining about his ministry. They, they're getting now that he's the Messiah, but what he's showing them now is that the Messiah has to suffer. And notice it says, he must go to Jerusalem. You see that word must? It's important to see that word there because that shows it was part of God's plan that Jesus would go to Jerusalem. And before now, he hasn't been to Jerusalem too much. Yeah? And now he's going to go to Jerusalem where there's a lot of people who don't like him and he's going to suffer a lot by them. He's basically, this is talking about the elders, chief priests and scribes. In other words, the Sanhedrin. He's going to go before the Jewish leaders and they are going to kill him. And he's going to rise again three days later and he must do this. That's what it says. He must because it's God's plan that Jesus dies to save his people. Remember at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, Matthew 1 21, it says, she will bear a son, it's talking about Mary, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You see, the, the Jews were thinking the Messiah's going to come and get rid of the Romans. And what the Bible's saying is the Messiah's going to come and save people from their sins, because that is man's greatest problem, is his sin. And the only way you can deal with that is by dying on the cross and taking our sin on the cross. So it was God's plan for Jesus to suffer and die and rise again. It's important to see this was not an accident. This wasn't Jesus getting caught when he was unaware. This is Jesus willingly going to the cross. He planned this to save you. In verse 22, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. So Peter takes Jesus aside, like gets him in the corner, rebukes him and says, far be it from you, which can also be translated, God forbid, or may God be merciful to you. So he's saying to Jesus, God forbid, God's not going to do that. God be merciful to you. In other words, Peter did not think that suffering was something that God had planned for his Messiah. So we see that Peter's perception of God's plan and the Messiah's role was wrong. Yeah, the way Peter perceived God's plan was wrong. And the way Peter perceived the Messiah's role was wrong. Now, it's worth pointing this out for two reasons. If Peter could get it wrong, imagine how we could get it wrong. And 
I said two reasons, main thing. First reason, a lot of so-called preachers have got it wrong about God's plan of salvation, God's plan of redemption. There are some preachers who don't believe in substitutionary atonement. In other words, they don't believe that Jesus took God's wrath on himself on the cross so that we wouldn't have to take God's wrath. And they're misunderstanding God's plan of salvation. And they don't preach about a Jesus who suffered. And then the second reason is many people sitting in church every Sunday who have the wrong perception of God's plan for their lives. And this comes from not understanding God's plan for Jesus' life. And they expect that their life should be so much better than Jesus's, and that their role should be involving less suffering than Jesus's. And we'll see later how this is wrong. So with this in mind, let's see how Jesus responded to Peter about this wrong understanding of God's plan and the Messiah's role. Verse 23, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. He's saying, get out of my way. And he calls him Satan because although it's Peter who's talking to him, and although it's Peter who's trying to get Jesus to not follow this mission of suffering that Jesus is talking about, Jesus recognizes that Satan is behind this. So it's Peter speaking, but (coughs) Satan is behind this. And this is really important, that Satan is behind attacks on God's plan. Satan is the one behind attacks on God's plan. We see this in the book of Revelation. We see that when the church is persecuted, Satan is behind it. Now in light of what we've just said about what some preachers are saying, where they deny what Jesus did on the cross, and what some people in the pews are thinking, this is very interesting. Because this means that when someone tries to distort the message of salvation and the message of the cross, when someone tries to do that, Satan is behind that. Even if the person doesn't realize Satan's behind it. I mean, you know, we don't get the impression that Peter was like, oh, now I am speaking for Satan. You know, he didn't realize. He just thought he was giving Jesus some good advice. He's saying, that isn't God's plan for you. God be merciful to you. No, that's not your job, not to suffer. No, don't take that. Don't accept that in the name of Jesus. That kind of, he thinks he's giving good advice. But Jesus looks at it and says, this is Satan's advice. He's trying to stop the plan of God. So we see that Satan is trying to get even preachers today to distort the message of the cross. Similarly, when someone tries to distort the lifestyle that God has called you to, Satan is behind that as well. Even if they don't realize it. You may have had someone say to you before, No, that's not your calling. God doesn't want you to have that job. Well, I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying that may be Satan speaking in that. So there's an application here for us to be very careful before we tell people, no, that's not your path. God doesn't want you to suffer that. Got to be really careful. Now, this is a bit like what happened in the wilderness. Do you remember when Jesus got tempted by Satan? And Satan then offered Jesus all these kingdoms without him having to suffer. And back then Jesus told Satan to get away. And now Jesus does the same thing. Because Satan's trying to get Jesus to not suffer. It's very subtle, isn't it? You would have thought, well, not suffering is a good thing. But here we've got the devil trying to get Jesus to not suffer. And that is a bad thing. So Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. And in the ESV footnotes at the bottom, it says, for the word hindrance, it says stumbling block. And that might ring a few bells in your head before we've seen this word crop up before in Matthew's gospel. The word here is scandalon. That's the Greek word. And in Bauer's dictionary, it has a meaning here 
an action or circumstance that leads one to act contrary to a proper course of action or set of beliefs. Temptation to sin or enticement. So this word here, scandalon, this word for stumbling block, is an action or circumstance that leads one to act contrary to a proper course of action. So we see here that if Jesus had of not suffered, if he decided, okay, I'm not going to go to Jerusalem and suffer, Jesus then would be acting contrary to the proper course of action that God planned for him. And this shows us how Satan works. Satan tries to get us to live our lives contrary to God's plan for us. You need to know this. You, you need to know this. If, if there was someone stalking you day in, day night, you need to know that. If there's someone planning to blow up your house, you need to know that. What you need to know today is that Satan tries to get you to live your life contrary to God's plan. It's important to be aware of this because it doesn't matter how strong you were in the past. It doesn't matter how spiritual you were yesterday or how spiritual you were five years ago. It doesn't matter how amazing you were on that youth camp when you gave your life to the Lord and prayed in tongues doesn't matter. Satan still wants to try and get you today to live your life contrary to God's plan. You could have been a rock last week, just like Peter. Peter went from rock to stumbling block, and you could do the same. Last night, I heard the story of a pastor who had a, a successful ministry and then slipped into moral sin, lost his marriage over it, lost being pastor over it. He's now repented and come back to God. But he was talking about how much it destroyed his life and how none of it was worth it. And you're like, well, how did this happen to this guy? This guy seemed like a rock. And he goes to a stumbling block. Now, similarly, when you're a stumbling block, you can be a stumbling block to other people in the church. Do you know that they used to make bullets to kill people. Then they started making bullets to injure people. Do you know why? In a war situation, if there's three of you and one of your mates gets shot and dies, you can leave him behind and get on your business and run off or whatever. But if your friend gets shot with a bullet that wounds him, now you both have to pick him up and carry him and you're slowed down. So that is military tactics now. Make bullets that wound people instead of killing them because it will slow everyone down. And I believe Satan does that. He gets someone, causes them to stumble, and he makes them a stumbling block for everyone else in the church. Just need one person to be made to live their life contrary to God's will, and that can affect all their brothers and sisters around them. And then try and get other people to deviate from God's plan. So here, Satan's trying to get Peter to cause Jesus to stumble. And the way it's happened is demonstrated in what Jesus says next. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not set in your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So we see here that the problem is that Je uh, not Jesus, Jesus is doing good. Peter is thinking like a human. He's thinking like a human, like we all do. Humans naturally want comfort. Humans naturally want a good life. And Peter thinks it would be better if Peter thinks it would be better if Peter thinks it would be better if Jesus had a comfortable good life rather than suffering. But God's thoughts are greater than man's thoughts. And God has planned for Jesus to suffer. And it's through this suffering that his people will be saved. Application here is set your mind on God's thoughts, not on your own. You've been conditioned from day one to set your thoughts on human matters. You've been brainwashed by the TV, by the radio, by all the advertisements out on the street, by the shopping malls, to take care of yourself and 
Make yourself comfortable. And these are human thoughts. And instead, we should set our minds on God's thoughts. Otherwise, we are vulnerable to Satan trying to make us deviate from God's plan for our life. There are plenty of man's thoughts floating around. There's false teachers who preach that you are good, that people are good. All you need to do is make yourself rich, make yourself happy, be the best you can be. There's adverts and salespeople who tell you, you need a new phone. You need more channels. You need a new console. You need faster internet. You need a better job. You need new clothes. You need a bigger house. You need a holiday. Interesting, we never see Jesus saying these things to his disciples. Never see him say that. Who is listening to the thoughts of God today? Who is listening to what God says instead of what the world is telling us? Who is reading God's word and saying, God, what is your will? Think about how many thoughts you've had this week that were concerned about yourself and making your life better and more comfortable. <coughs> what desires have you had? What desires have you had for time? In other words, how often have you thought, I want more time for myself? How often have you thought, I want more money for myself? Or I want more sin for myself? Has Satan been speaking to you? Most probably he has, unless you're a robot. So now let's listen to Jesus' voice and see what Jesus is saying. Verse 24, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He says, if anyone would come after me. In other words, if anyone would be a disciple, if anyone would be a Christian, then they should do the following. They should deny himself or herself. So we see here that a Christian is someone who denies himself or denies herself. That's what a Christian is, someone who denies himself. Now, if it's a hot summer's day and you're out with a friend and you've got 60p and they've got no money and you're desperate for a drink and you see a drink for 60p, if you give them the 60p and say, drink that drink and drink it all yourself, then you are denying yourself. And here the picture is so much bigger than that. It's not talking about just denying yourself things. It's talking about denying your rights to yourself. Denying your rights. Now that is so hard for us to get in England. Because we're always told about our rights. And yet Jesus is saying deny your rights. If you want an idea of what kind of denial it is, look at the next bit. He says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now he says, let him take up his cross. That's the kind of denial it is. Now in those days, a lot of people who were crucified would be made to carry the cross being to their cross. After they've been beaten, brutally beaten, where a lot of people would die during the beating, after that, they'll be made to carry a heavy wooden crossbeam, take it to the place of crucifixion, and there they would be crucified on it. Now, at this stage, the disciples don't really get that Jesus is going to do this himself. Later, they obviously read much more significance into this. But at the time, what they're getting is the idea of Jesus saying to fishermen, tax collectors, average people, saying, deny yourself, don't not deny yourself some food tonight. Deny yourself in a sense that give up your rights and pick up your cross and go and die. It would, I don't know what we have these days. What could we say? Deny yourself and strap yourself in an electric chair? Not a very appealing message. But the picture Jesus gives is graphic. He's talking about denying yourself and living a life of suffering that leads to death. And it's a decision you have to make. You don't fall into Christianity. 
You have to actually say, I'm going to deny myself, pick up my cross, and live a life of suffering that leads to death. Now, we, we get this imagery wrong when we have something bad happen to us at work and someone says to us, oh, well, we all have our crosses to bear. That is not what it means. It does not mean you have to work an extra half hour at work. Oh, well, we have our crosses to bear. That's nowhere near the picture of carrying the cross to your place of execution. And in the West, we have totally lost the significance of this verse. And we think it means put the chairs away at the end of service. I've carried my cross. You know, that, that's just nowhere near the level of self-denial Jesus is talking about. He's talking about excruciating pain, being beaten severely, carrying wood, getting splinters on your already shredded skin, tired, out of energy, dehydrated, and the whole time knowing that you're about to have nails put through your hands and feet and left there to die an excruciating death of suffocation. But this is what a Christian is. A Christian willingly suffers a great deal in their service to God. The question is, are you in pain because of your service to God? Are you in pain because of your service to the church? Because of your service to the lost souls of Roehampton? Do you agonize over the people of Roehampton when you pray? Do you agonize over the youth in London who are getting killed on a regular? Are you denying yourself in terms of time, in terms of money? Are you asking God for help because it's so painful, the level of self-denial that you're living at? And you're saying, God, I need grace to get through this. Or are you constantly trying to make your life more comfortable with more food, more money, more TV, better job, bigger house? There's only one way to follow Jesus, and it's with a cross. You can't follow Jesus without a cross on your back. Look at the end of the verse. It ends with, and follow me. In other words, you have to deny yourself, you have to take up your cross, and follow Jesus. You cannot follow Jesus without a cross. There's a cross for every Christian. Are you carrying yours at the moment? Do you have yours on today? Have you been carrying it? If not, will you carry it today? Maybe you've just slipped into this Christian thing. It's just a gradual thing. Maybe today's the day to say, Jesus, I will pick up my cross and follow you. I'm going to give up a life of comfort for myself, and I'm going to live to glorify you and imitate you in your sufferings. Maybe today is a day to do that. Maybe today is a day to say, Jesus, I'm sorry, I haven't been carrying any cross. I've just been getting comfortable, and I repent now. Help me carry the cross. Look at what Jesus goes on to say. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I'll read that out again. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, you may be sitting here listening to this and thinking, wow, this... This isn't what I was expecting to hear this morning. I was hoping for a boost. I could have boosted you with lies, but instead I'm going to boost you now with the truth. Jesus says, whoever would save his life will lose it. In other words, if you read this text today and you're thinking, I don't like this cross thing. That sounds like losing my life. I'm going to try and save my life now. I'm going to preserve it, and I'm going to ignore all this cross and self-denial business, and I'm going to live a comfortable life now. I'll still be a Christian, but I'm going to put in safeguards so that I have a comfortable life. Because I think I could serve God better that way. If you do that, Jesus says, you will lose your life. In other words, you try to preserve your life right now, you're going to lose eternal life with Jesus in heaven. If you don't deny yourself today, you will be 
denied eternal life later. But on the flip side, he says, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In other words, if you're sitting here and thinking, this cross stuff sounds really difficult and it sounds painful and it reminds me of what we hear about loads of other Christians in the world going through, Christians in Pakistan, Christians in Burma, Christians in China, Christians in North Korea, people who have body parts chopped off as a, as a soldier tells them to deny Jesus Christ and yet they don't. You might think, boy, that sounds like that and that sounds difficult. But you might be thinking, I think I, I, I still want to do this for Jesus' name. And Jesus is saying, you might lose your life now, but you will actually find your life. In other words, in eternity, you will live with Jesus forever. And whatever you went through in these three school years and ten that we live, or shorter, will be nothing compared to bathing in God's glory for eternity. So if you deny yourself today for Jesus, you will find eternal life with Christ. Now, I'd like to point out that he says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It's really important that bit there because you have to deny yourself for Jesus' sake, not for anyone else's sake. In other words, if you deny yourself and start serving other people more, but your motivation is you want to look good in front of people, then this don't count. Yeah, so, so forget that. <laughs> if you think, yeah, I'm going to deny myself and serve other people, um, and then I'll benefit from that, and people will think I'm really good, then you're not doing that for Jesus' sake. If you do it thinking, oh, I look good in front of the pastor, then uh, no, it doesn't count. It only counts if you do it for Jesus' sake. Now, if you do it because there's a, a family member you're afraid of and you don't want them to think bad about you and so you serve them, <clears throat> that doesn't count either. The only way it counts is if we do it for the sake of Jesus. If we say, Jesus, I will do this to glorify you. Now reading on, verse 26, he says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? That first phrase there, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? In other words, you can get all the channels you want. Yeah, You can get the fastest internet connection there is. You can get the latest console. You can get the latest games. You can get the latest computer. You can get the latest clothes. You can get the latest package holiday. Get the latest type of car, latest house, latest phone, latest pocket PC, all these things. But you can lose your soul and spend eternity in hell. It's not worth it. And the second phrase says, or well, what shall a man give in return for his soul? In other words, there's nothing you can acquire in this life that equals the value of your soul. On judgment day, you can't say, well, I'll tell you what, God, I give you all these things back now. Can I have my soul? You can't say, I've got a big bank account. Can I have my soul? It won't work like that. And then people will realize, ah, oh, all the things I tried to build up on earth nothing compared to the value of my soul. So the point is, prioritize for your soul in eternity. I can guarantee you that your flesh and Satan right now is trying to tell you, don't deny yourself. You can have a good life now. Get comfortable. And what I'm saying is, prioritize for your soul in eternity Deny yourself today. Suffer for Jesus. Suffer for his church. Don't put earthly things as a priority above your soul. Because Jesus will come back and he'll look at your deeds. As we see in the next verse. Verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. See, Jesus is trying to get his disciples to plan for the future. He's showing them eschatology now. He's showing them things of the end times 
to try and get them to think about the future, their eternal future. He's showing them that all this cross carrying they have to do now will be worth it because if they carry their cross, Jesus is going to come back and he'll repay them. Jesus will reward your cross carrying. If you were sitting here today thinking, yeah, but where's the prosperity? Come on, give me the blessings. Well, here they are. But they come after cross carrying. Now, it works the other way. If you haven't carried your cross, then when Jesus repays you on that day, it's not going to be good. He's going to be repaying you with punishment. And that's really important to know. If you're not carrying your cross for Jesus, then when Jesus repays you for what you've done, it will be bad. It will be eternal suffering in hell. You don't want that. And then the next verse, verse 28. This is the last verse. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, there's a number of different interpretations of this. There's what, basically, one interpretation is that it's talking about the next few verses where you have the transfiguration and they see Jesus in his glory. There's a problem with that interpretation, which is that he says, some of you standing here will not taste death until they see this thing happen. And given that what happens, happens within a week, it seems a funny phrase. If I said to you guys, in the notices, not that I did them, but if they had said, now some of you won't taste death, uh, some of you ain't going to die before we do uh, the Thursday night Bible study. <laughs> it's a bit of a strange phrase to use. It seems like Jesus is talking about something that is quite a bit ahead in the future, and some of them may die before they, they've seen it, but some of them won't. Um, so that there's a problem with that interpretation. Um, another view is that when it says the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, it can refer to the resurrection. And, and that's possible. Again, some would say, well, why does he say some of you won't die before this happens when the resurrection and, and death isn't that far away? Others say it's Pentecost, which, which is also um, quite possible. Some say it's the, death it's the resurrection and Pentecost and then the gospel going all over the Roman world. And that's the interpretation that I sit on today. I'm not dogmatic about it. I think that's what it means. Others say it's talking about the very end when Jesus comes back. And we have a problem there in that all the people have died and Jesus hasn't come back yet. Um, so I, I think because this phrase about the Son of Man coming in his kingdom can have a number of valid interpretations. It doesn't have to just be eschatological. I think that it actually is referring to the fact that he's saying some of you, you cross carriers, some of you are going to die, you're going to have a, a life of suffering for me. But I'm telling you, some of you are going to see so much of my glory. You're going to see me rise again three days later. You're going to see the day of Pentecost. And some of you are going to see the gospel go all over the Roman world and the whole Roman world just turned upside down as a result of your cross carrying. That's what, that's what I think it means. And the application... The application is, think about the future for Roehampton. If you carry your crosses today, live a life of suffering, think about in 50 years' time how many souls are going to be saved in Roehampton because of our cross carrying today. I know I wouldn't be here today if my mum hadn't carried her cross. I know that there's people years ago that prayed a lot for Roehampton. And here we are today. And who knows what's going to happen in the future if we will carry our crosses and then see Jesus glorified in the world. So let's sum this all up. We looked at how Jesus wants people to know him and follow him in the proper way. So beware of preachers who preach Jesus as if Jesus is some life coach or motivator. You know, that, that is not how he's betrayed in the Gospels. The Gospel is not some Dr. Phil message or some Oprah message. Be careful of people who say it's all about making your life more comfortable. 
Be careful of preachers who don't tell you who the real Jesus is, the Jesus who suffered. And remember, it was God's plan for Jesus to suffer and die and rise again. So we also need to be careful of people that tell us that the substitutionary atonement is a myth. We also need to be careful of people who tell us that it's not God's plan that you ever suffer. We really care for, a lot of people say that. Boy, I, I've had that said to me so many times. And there's so many scriptures to contradict that. And it's normally said by people that don't really read their Bibles properly, but they just pick out verses here and there, and they quote them out of context. But from what Jesus taught us today, we know quite clearly that we are called to suffer. Remember that Peter's perception of God's plan and his perception of the Messiah was wrong. So we can get the wrong perception too. He have the wrong perception of what our role is. And remember that Satan is behind attacks on God's plan. Behind all the false teaching that goes on, behind what's going on in your head where you think, I don't want to suffer, I just want to live a good life. As Satan. And remember that Satan tries to get us to live our lives contrary to God's plan for us. Satan wants you rich. He does. I'm telling you, he wants you rich. He wants you super rich so that you don't need God anymore. Because when you get rich, you stop praying. When you, when you don't have to worry about paying your food bills this week, you stop praying. You stop saying, God, help me pay for my food this week. Satan wants you rich and cozy. You know what as well? He wants you really well rested. Yeah? He wants you to not come to Bible studies and prayer meetings and what have you because you need to rest because you've got bags under your eyes. Yeah, yeah, Satan will say, hey, you've got bags under your eyes. Get rid of them. You need more sleep. Maybe you do need more sleep. But what is God saying? What is God saying? Is God saying get more sleep on Saturday night so you can come to church on Sunday? <coughs> Set your mind on God's thoughts, not on your own. We do this by being saturated with scripture. Get a Bible reading plan that you can stick to and read through it every day. I think it's sad how much people don't read their, their Bibles today. And um, if you want recommendations of a good Bible reading plan, then, then ask me afterwards. I would recommend, just as a, not as a law to follow, but I'd recommend you want to be reading something like four chapters of the Bible every day. That's not a lot. It really isn't. It's, it's, you spend more time eating food um, than that. And it says, man does not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. That's just a suggestion. I don't want to make a law here. You have to read four chapters. It's just a suggestion. Um, a Christian is someone who denies himself or herself. That's what a Christian is. And a Christian willingly suffers a great deal in their service to God. You cannot follow Jesus without a cross. That, that ain't a Christian. If, if you're saying, well, I can be a Christian without a cross, no, you can't. Take it up with Jesus. I don't make the rules. It's what Jesus said. You have to have a cross. If you don't deny yourself today, you'll be denied eternal life later. But if you deny yourself today for Jesus, you will find eternal life with Christ. So prioritize for your soul in eternity. And Jesus will reward your cross carrying. Now maybe you've heard all this and you're convicted and you're now saying, I want to carry my cross that Jesus gives me. But maybe you're thinking, I can't. And that's a good place to be. Because what we need to do is cry out for Jesus' mercy and say, Jesus, will you give me the grace that I can carry the cross you've appointed for me? I can't do it on my own. I'm not thinking that by being a good person, I'll get myself into heaven. I know I'm a sinner and I just trust you to save me. And will you give me the grace to carry the cross? Let's pray that now. Jesus, I'm in awe at your glory and your majesty and your humility that you was in heaven 
in the glory of the Father, in your own glory, in the glory of the Holy Spirit, and you left that and came down here and lived as a man, and you were beaten, and you carried the cross, and you wore the cross and died a painful death on the cross for us. I'm sorry for my sin, Lord. Lord, we say we are so sorry for all our sins. We are so sorry for being rebels, being God-haters. We are so sorry for always wanting to take care of ourselves and live comfortable lives. We ask that you forgive us. We're trusting in you today on what you did on the cross, that you took God's wrath for our sin so that now we can have a relationship with you, knowing that God the Father is not angry with us, not angry at our sin. And we realize, Jesus, that we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross, that we have to choose suffering over comfort, that we have to choose you over ourselves, that we have to choose our brothers and sisters in the church over ourselves, and that we have to choose helping the lost over ourselves. And we can't do this in our own strength, Lord. So I pray for your grace and your mercy. Pray that you would renew our hearts and minds. Make us worthy of the calling you gave us and help us to live a life of suffering to glorify you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.